Our last stop of the day is uh, Jennifer Glass. All right, uh, can you hear me in the back? Yeah, okay, great. So thanks everybody for sticking around for my the last talk. This is, only, this is I think the shortest talk, so don't worry, you don't have too much more. Um, and we're gonna first of all, uh, well, my talk today is on the geochemical cycles of present day Earth. Present day Earth, you know, we're geologists, we're gonna extend that back, let's say 500 million years, because that, that's what we haven't talked about yet is the Phanerozoic. Um, so, moving right on, we've, uh, you've been sitting for a while, so feel free to stand up and take a deep breath and uh, stretch and uh, think about what you're breathing right now. <laughs> All right, so this is what you're breathing right now, right? And you've been hearing today about what are some potential biosignatures in what you are breathing right now that could also apply to the exoplanets that you study. And the two that we have primarily talked about today are oxygen and methane. And as uh, Tim Lyons nicely just presented to you in the, on the modern Earth, right? Oxygen, we have 21% oxygen but only 0.0018%, um, 0.0018% uh, methane, right? Although that methane is still a very important greenhouse gas on modern Earth, um, even though it's much less abundant than it used to be. And what is so important, the reason that these can be considered as potential biosignatures for exoplanets, right? Biosignatures, because they have no significant abiotic sources. Now, I'll give the caveat that there are, as I'll talk about, especially for methane, there are some, some abiotic um, ways to, to make methane, but really what it comes back to on the modern Earth is life is really dominating these cycles, and that's what I'll present to you. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of the methane, it's really microbial dominated. In terms of oxygen, we now have plants, and so uh, plants are pretty important too but it came originally from, from bacteria, the pathways. All right, so now that we've enjoyed our breath of potential exoplanet atmospheres, uh, moving right along, I've been charged with giving you um, two cycles today, two modern cycles that, uh, to think about. These are uh, methane, the methane cycle, and the oxygen cycle, the two I just pointed out. And then at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit just to kind of move you into the, the uh, future talks, especially by Hilary Hartnett. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about limiting nutrients like phosphorus. So starting off, first of all, with the methane cycle. So like I said, these two cycles, methane and oxygen, these are dominated by biological pathways on modern Earth, and they probably have been throughout, throughout um, Earth history. Right, and so where is the meth most of the methane coming from? Right now it's just that little bit, but way back in Earth history, there's a lot more, right, as uh, Tim Lyons talked about. So it is, methanogenesis is a microbial process. This is the biological pathway. I'm skipping a lot of steps here, but basically it is hydrogen is being used to reduce CO2 to methane and then water as a byproduct. And this is happening by a whole series of enzymes, most all of which are very rich in metal, probably a remnant of the fact that the ancient ocean, as Tim talked about, was so rich in iron. So in fact, this first enzyme in, um, in, in, in uh, biological methanogenesis by these tiny little cells is filled with iron sulfur clusters. Um, that Paul Falkowski studies, and I'll tell you more about. So iron sulfur, 46 iron sulfur clusters, in fact, in this first, in this first enzyme. The last enzyme, interestingly, is, has a nickel right in the center of it, um, in, this, in this porphyrin cofactor. 
And that's also interesting because we think maybe nickel was a lot higher in the ancient way back in time too. So this is, this is probably a very ancient pathway, um, but it is still very important um, on modern earth. In fact, about half of us in this room probably are making methane right now. Our cells aren't, our, our keel cells in our guts are making methane right now as we <laughs> digest. So this happens uh, amazingly um, at, you know, maybe we don't think it's amazing, but it really, it really is when we think about how complex these molecular machines are. It's happening at, you know, ambient temperatures all around us right now. But very importantly, all these, these enzymes with all of these metal cofactors, this process is totally stifled in the presence of oxygen. So I'll get back to this about how these are really a, these, these organisms that, you, that use this process to conserve energy are really at the very bottom of the food chain on modern Earth. And yet they're still very important. So does this happen abiotically? Yes, it does, but the fluxes are very low. And so that's why we can consider, by and large, methane to be an important biosignature. But there are some ways of doing it. In fact, in industry, some of these have been important. You might have heard of the fischer trope uh, process, all right, where um, hydrogen used to reduce carbon monoxide. However, it typically to methane. Um, and also this methanation process, abiotic methanation, the same, same reaction you saw earlier can occur uh, how abiotically. However, it typically requires higher temperatures and the presence of a metal catalyst, all right? And those just in nature don't happen um, very often. So we primarily have biological methanogenesis. It does happen, and there's been a lot of studies uh, you might have heard about, um, at, um, at some interesting ecosystems on the seafloor and volcanoes. There are some systems where it happens, but the um, fluxes are just way, way lower than biological. And so this is a nice review by Arnie, uh, Jada Arnie, uh, Astrobiology 2018, at, uh, reviewing these studies approximately 130th to 100th one, of the present biotic flux. Um, for abiotic methane uh, estimates. You might have heard something called serpentinization. That's a term that geologists love. We love to think about it in the context of the ancient earth. Serpentinization, that doesn't directly make methane itself. That's a common misperception that I'd like to clarify. Um, so basically, and we talked about this earlier today, um, that olivine reacts with water to form serpentine and accessory minerals and getting off hydrogen. It's this hydrogen that's the important thing when you think about, um, when you think about uh, methane production. So it's not, the serpentinization is not directly giving you methane. It's uh, giving you hydrogen that then can react with CO2 uh, to form methane either biologically with the enzymes or abiotically if you have those conditions we talk about here with these very, you know, typically higher temperatures and metal catalysts. All right, so biology has found this way to make methane to conserve energy. And today that is very important for giving us biological methane emissions to the atmosphere that we are concerned about right now. For, for, um, and so about half actually of biological methane emissions today are coming essentially from wetlands and manufactured wetlands in rice paddies. Um, and so why? Well, because these water saturated conditions are great basically for cultivating um, methanogens, right? Because they do not like oxygen. And I'll in a few minutes get to who these creatures are exactly that I'm referring to. <clears throat> but these cells, these microbial cells are living in these environments and emitting uh, methane. All right, then the other ones, the ocean actually is a tiny, tiny little bit. Okay, that's because there's a whole water column filled with primarily with a lot of oxygen so that whatever comes out of the sediment um, is usually in, mo in modern earth, maybe not in ancient earth probably, but in modern earth it gets oxidized before it can get all the way out to the atmosphere. But cows, cows maybe are up to humans and livestock up to a quarter of biological methane emissions because of those, those anoxic conditions in um, their guts, that um, uh, their stomach, I guess they have multiple stomachs, so they burp methane, I guess. 
primarily termites, interestingly, a little bit from termites, also in their guts, uh, these symbionts, and then um, a little bit from hydrothermal vents. But really, it's these water-saturated wetland um, ecosystems that the majority of the methane is coming from. Okay, and also, again, places where humans have basically made these anoxic conditions that promote methane production, like landfills and sewage treatment plants. So what exactly is happening here? Okay, this, this is, I'm going to try to break this down. So basically, we have organic matter, right? Say a leaf or something is falling into the soil. It's made of proteins, polysaccharides, lipids. Okay, other organisms, first of all, break this down. Other bacteria and fungi break this down and break it down into simpler and simpler and simpler pieces. Finally, it gets all the way basically to the simplest, acetate and hydrogen, uh, excuse me, um, and methylated compounds, or maybe all the way down to CO2, okay, breathed off by bacteria. So it's, it's at this very bottom of the food chain then, once, it's every, once other organisms have digested it and they've consumed all the oxygen, that you get all the way down to the bottom here, and that's where the methanogens um, actually can um, do their job and emit methane. And then what happens to the methane Okay, well, sometimes it just bubbles straight out under some conditions, but in other conditions, if it's, if it's diffusing through this um, different, maybe back up through this uh, different, um, different redox zones in, in, a, in a sediment profile, it's going to encounter different oxidants. And, 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 that, and microorganisms are going to actually use these more oxidized compounds to oxidize the methane. And so maybe very little of it is released if it has a chance to see all of these other oxidants. The major sink for atmospheric methane is um, photolytic um, uh, destruction. It depends on hydroxyl radicals. So actually, modern methane's atmospheric lifetime is quite short, about 10 years. Um, and it, that may not be quite as fast in an atmosphere without, without oxygen. Um, so here's the uh, modern methane sources and sinks. So again, just driving home this point, it's really these, these wetlands that are the primary natural source, okay, and uh, this tropospheric um, hydroxyl radicals as the sink. Um, now, anthropogenic, again, it's really that humans turn natural, kind of cultivate natural lands and livestock, basically, uh, to promote these anoxic conditions that that leads to most of the methane flux. Um, there are also some from uh, fossil fuels, but a lot of that originally came from ancient organic matter that's um, uh, heated up and, and has me have produced methane. Okay, so who are these organisms, these microbial methane makers? These are within, some of you have heard, well, there's three domains of life, right? There's eukaryotes, and there's bacteria, and there's archaea. So the archaea are the ones, some, some archaea can make methane to conserve energy. Uh, most of them, up until a few years ago, we thought they were all within the urearchaea, okay? But now recently we have, uh, it has been discovered that there are actually some um, also in, potentially in other, uh, in other clades as well, but we think that's really exciting. But to astronomers, they're still all, all archaea so far, <laughs> okay? So um, I can go into much more detail about this. Okay, um, they grow at extreme conditions. I think that's important for you to know. Um, you know, extreme, they can grow all the way down to like freezing conditions in Antarctic lake sediments and all the way up to uh, boiling conditions. Um, they can grow at, you know, they've been shown to grow at really big uh, pressure um, <clears throat> ranges and so, there's, there's quite a few studies proposing that, methane, uh, that methanogens could even still be present potentially on Mars, making the whiffs of methane we've been seeing, even on Enceladus. And there's just a paper out looking at potential um, bio, at biological methane production in Enceladus conditions where they grew these modern methanogens under Enceladus conditions, and they showed that they can, they can um, still do this, this process even at 50 bar pressure. Um, and so, yeah, maybe on exoplanets, you actually have these organisms or something like them. It's, it's quite possible. 
And so, what about oxygen? So now I'm going to go through and uh, take you through the same thing for, for the modern oxygen cycle. So we take another deep breath, and you should be thanking cyanobacteria that Tim Lyons talked about earlier for the oxygen that you just breathed, because the cyanobacteria were the ones who originally invented this oxygen evolving complex, very rich in manganese. It is nature's oxygen producer. It originated in cyanobacteria at least uh, 2.4 billion years ago. Paul Falkowski in the room, you can ask him all about it. He's written all the papers on this. And it has spread to al algae and plants by endosymbiosis. So the plants, you know, they're very important in the modern oxygen cycle, but really we have the cyanobacteria to thank that was then captured uh, by eukaryotes and turned into plants. Okay, so in terms then, you might think, what controls the oxygen in the atmosphere, right? You might think, well, it's the plants, right? But actually, the, it's, it's just about perfectly balanced between the photosynthesis, right, and aerobic respiration. And so these are big fluxes, as I'll show in a minute, uh, but they almost perfectly balance themselves. So the question is, what is actually driving net export of oxygen to the atmosphere? Um, and so um, I also want you to note before I go on that, um, that photosynthesis, right, is using nutrients to make biomass, which is abbreviated here, actually very simply as formaldehyde. Then this is way oversimplified, right, but we just use this abbreviation. And then when aerobic respiration happens, those nutrients are released again. And by, and I'm going to talk about in a minute, red field ratio. It is a very specific ratio that life uses, what life needs generally. And so these are going to be actually, when they're released, they're released actually with a, with a, um, they're in biomass with a certain ratio. And sometimes we can see that imprint on the environment as well. Okay, so here are these big fluxes, there's paramoles of oxygen per year happening in um, primary production on land and in marine ecosystems. Great review paper here uh, for you to check out for more information on this. So how do we get actual export of oxygen to the atmosphere? So as Tim talked about, this requires burial. This requires sequestration of reductants that, could that would consume this oxygen, namely that organic matter that, that's used during aerobic respiration. And so these are smaller fluxes here, but these are the ones that are really pretty vital in terms of getting actually that oxygen exported. And so these are, these are instead of, you know, um, back on our primary production slide, we were, oops, talking about, right, we were talking um, in the thousands of teramol, and now we are talking just tens uh, here. So, okay, so here is organic matter. That is a key reductant. And another key reductant is um, actually fool's gold, essentially. It's very common in, sediment, in sediments. Um, it can also um, oxidize um, oxygen and consume it. So we, if we bury organic matter and iron and sulfur in sediments, we take away those reductants and basically can, can export that oxygen to the atmosphere. And this is very key, as Tim talked about, for controlling oxygen over over uh, Earth history and also for modern um, oxygen cycling. Okay, so here in all its glory is the full cycle. Um, the main, this is created by a wonderful student of ours at Georgia Tech. By the way, we, um, I'm very excited about editing Wikipedia pages and I encourage all of you in your respective fields to check out your Wikipedia pages and see how they are and if they're really bad, fix them because you're all experts and, <laughs> and uh, uh, we, the community needs that. And so, um, and so here, putting this all together um, again, here's that, you saw this before and this before, here's that burial, uh, here is the oxygen export due to the burial of organic carbon. Um, the main sink then is then the oxidation of organic matter again um, by weathering processes. So back to that nutrient thing, another key term I was supposed to get across to you is red field ratio. So I said, um, remember that the um, uh, respirers, right, the, the, the primary producers take in nutrients with this consistent, fairly consistent ratio, 
and the uh, respirers then release it again, uh, and it's released with kind of consistent ratio. And in some places, in fact, like the, the ocean, the deep ocean waters, way back um, in 19, you know, the early 1930s, actually Alfred Redfield uh, reported that there's this very consistent ratio he found actually in the dissolved nitrate and phosphate in the deep ocean and also in the marine phytoplankton that he measured. And so this is almost like a biosignature in a way. It's that the biology has left its imprint on the ocean, uh, on the ocean chemistry. Um, and it's now been extended to include terrestrial life and trace elements as well. Um, so in a way, you can think about nutrient limitation like baking a cake. So, um, you know, you need this ratio of eggs to flour to sugar, right, and then some trace stuff. And if you only have four eggs, right, you, even if you have infinite flour and sugar, you can only make one cake. So similarly, if you try to make an organism, like this is a diatom, which is very important for marine primary productivity, you need to have 106 moles carbon, 60 moles nitrogen, one mole phosphorus. If you only have that one mole phosphorus, even if you have infinite nitrogen and carbon, you can only make one diatom. So you start to see, uh, and then we start to think about trace elements as well. And phosphorus is gonna become, I think, important in, uh, in Hillary Hartnett's talk in the future. So I'm gonna highlight a little bit more about the importance of phosphorus because um, earlier today, um, we had Kevin Zomley nicely gave us this Atmo file, and you've heard about these Goldschmidt classifications. Well, phosphorus is um, trapped in rocks, and it is not in the atmosphere. And so that becomes very important when we think about controls on primary productivity. So uh, phytoplankton really need that phosphorus, and they cannot get it from the atmosphere. They can get from the atmosphere their nitrogen, if they can fix nitrogen and their carbon, but they cannot get the phosphorus from the nitrogen uh, from the atmosphere. And interestingly, under low oxygen conditions, then there's actually a feedback that happens that may be important for regulating oxygen because phosphorus is released from sediments and then can be used to fertilize phytoplankton growth. And we like to think a lot about these kind of feedbacks. What what could have basically modulated this oxygen going up and down. It could have also been fires, there's been, it's been proposed, and there's a nice Catling Zomley uh, review that I encourage you to check out that I think nicely um, summarizes this evolution of atmospheric oxygen. Um, and so I'm just gonna conclude with one more point I wanted, I was told to make, which was, which is about how life gets scarce bioessential elements. And I think there's really three ways, three categories you can think of that life is able to acquire these, these um, incredibly good, at, oops, I'm sorry, at acquiring these scarce bioessential elements. The first is it can store. So life stores in various mechanisms, such as sometimes it makes minerals and granules. Um, this is polyphosphate, a, a phosphorus storage mechanism. And of course, we're storing right now iron, right, in ferritin. So all kinds of different um, storage mechanisms for these important trace elements that life needs. Substitution is another one. Um, for instance, with phosphorus, uh, uh, phospholipids in some cases can actually be replaced with non-phosphorus lipids um, under uh, phosphorus starvation. And a third one is scavenging. Life has evolved a whole host of different ways, especially bacterial, microbial life, has evolved various ways, uh, fascinating mechanisms, producing organic acids um, and very specific biomolecules to go out and scavenge and take back up with very specific transporters and even rip off molecules of other ones and steal it from other ones. And so the moral of the story is basically that life finds a way. And that's it. <laughs> okay. And these are, um, okay. Those are some references I recommend on all of these, all these slides. Thank you. Uh, questions for Jen? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, pretty nice overview. Um, I was thinking of the Jen part. Um, so we've 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, yeah because you you wouldn't have weathering um essentially would be the problem so you wouldn't I mean um I haven't thought about it to answer your question <laughs> I bet some people in the audience have <laughs> But, oh, yeah, Hillary, yeah. It's kind of those sort of, like, extremes, and I believe that the very small end of the opportunity is to vote. I think we're going to hear a lot more about this tomorrow, or when Hillary talks now. Okay. Uh, it's a good question. I don't know. I think it would be a problem to not have continental weathering. Yeah. Nitrogen? Well, I mean, that's degassed from the mantle. And is that what you asked? Where does the nitrogen come from? And bio biology, you're right. It's also denitrified. Yeah. Yeah. So it's partly, right, partly biotic, partly abiotic. Yeah. Does that... But, but there's so much from the mantle, right? It can't, I don't think it can really, I like talking about an N2O. <laughs> I think that's an interesting one because that can be nitrous oxide as, a, as fascinating to me because it's, uh, it's kind of ambiguous in its biosignature. Is it, there are, I'm sorry, but that's not what you were asking. <laughs> you, okay. <laughs> well, thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.